dedicated my personal and professional life to caring deeply about our elders. And I thought that I had found my calling. But it wasn't until I received a, a call, I think it was from uh, Justice Stratton, and began working in the field of um, criminal justice and incarcerated settings that I really found my passion and understood that it, it's, it's, so, it's so personal for me to make a difference in people that need us so very, very much. And so you might see a few tears coming down my cheeks, and I, I apologize in advance for that. Um, I also, though, should start with an apology. I'm going to start with a kind of uh, making sure that you feel empowered. That I've been here for about 20 minutes, and I've heard a lot of stories already about individuals, family members, people of faith communities, and neighbors. Um, even though we are here in a professional capacity, and I have no authority to, to say this because I know you're all employed by organizations, but if you want your mind to wander, I'm giving you the privilege and the courage to say, think about your own situation. See if there is something that you are learning today that can be helpful to you. I have eight grandkids and I'm always telling them which listening ears to put on. Put on whatever listening ears um, work for you. And also feel free to interrupt me if it's something that is poignant to you. We want to be as helpful as possible. And then I ask our folks who are leading to totally interrupt me at the end because I'll talk forever. <laughs> okay. Today we are here to talk about, I'm going to talk about the introduction to dementia for our legal, criminal, and judicial systems. I may have said some of those words wrong because I am an outsider, but uh, hopefully that covers um, everything. What I want to do, because I have um, colleagues from um, the O4A here today, and I don't want them to have to raise their hand and correct me, dementia is not a mental health disorder. Dementia is not part of the mental health system, but it is connected to it. And so it is important that we are able to think about it and advocate. It is a neurocognitive disorder, but it affects the mental well-being of families and individuals. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's get started. Um, and when you see here also from awareness to social action, um, I also don't accept excuses. So after leaving here, there isn't going to be an excuse to say, gosh, that was really interesting, but I don't think I'm going to do something. No, 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 no. I'm here today because we are going to act, and we're going to act together, and we're going to make um, a difference. And so by the end, you have to figure out what actions you all are going to take and my organization is here to help in any way possible. So our objectives for today. First, I want to, and I already started, talk about what dementia is and isn't. My oh, okay. Just why it is very important for us to be talking about dementia. Third, let's talk about why Ohio is the absolute leader right now. And if you ask the ABA Commission on Long-Term Care and Aging, they will say, Everybody should be doing what Ohio is doing, and I think that's very cool. I'm going to talk about the impact and the outcomes. Um, this is not about just doing good. This is about making a difference. And we should stop doing what we're doing if it's not working, but we're going to show you that it is. And then if there is time, which there won't be, um, to discuss what are some of the opportunities going forward. I'm laughing because they know me back there. OK. Who am I here representing? All of these folks have been involved to date. This is a really impressive group around our state, and I can say on a national basis the um, ABA has been involved um, quite a little bit. Um, and then in red, I put in, um, would you guys get involved? And I hope the answer is yes, please. Okay. So real quickly, because we're not going to have time to really go through what dementia is, and we're very happy to offer any kind of webinar for anyone who's interested in learning more about dementia. But in essence, it's very important to understand dementia and Alzheimer's are not the same thing. Dementia is not a disease. Dementia is a series of symptoms. Now, you're all going to be, as you listen to this, say, 
hmm, as I listen to these symptoms, I wonder if I have dementia. Um, I can read minds, that's the other thing. I forgot, you didn't put that in the introduction. Yeah, I can read minds. Dementia symptoms, it, it is dementia when it is enough to interfere with your daily life. If you go upstairs and can't remember what you went upstairs for, which we all did this morning, I'm sure, if we live in two-story houses, but you remember to go back upstairs, retrace your steps, and you found that you're just fine. If you went upstairs to find something, and it was your keys, and you ultimately found it in the freezer, that's a very different situation. It is not only memory changes. We do it an absolute disservice when we talk about memory care units, and I'm not a fan of calling them memory care units because we, we keep people thinking that dementia and memory are the same things. We are talking about changes in um, thinking skills, uh, and as you'll see, many other activities um, as well. Okay. So again, Alzheimer's is one form of dementia. We unfortunately oftentimes use them synonymously, but it does, it does account for about 60 to 80 percent of the uh, cases of dementia. For those of you that are taking notes, you will be receiving all of these slides, so please know that um, I'm not trying to call you out. You're not the only one. <laughs> And we have many different kinds of dementia, and if anybody wants additional information on them, I'd be very happy to provide that for you. This is the frame for what I want to talk about today and for all of us going forward. First, dementia is not something that we talk about only in the medical care community. It is a top public health priority. It impacts everyone in the community. It is a series of symptoms that is not only inside of you, it impacts your entire family, your entire community, and we all have a role to play in ensuring that people who are living with dementia can live with as much meaning, purpose, and joy as possible. Enough already saying that we well, want to age in place. I don't want to age just in my home. I want to age in my community. And so it is a public health priority. Secondly, whereas everyone has a role to play, it is very clear on a national, state, and local level that an overlooked group of people with dementia are those involved in the criminal justice system, and therefore we are here today. There are two pathways into the criminal justice system, and I've already been talking with some of you personally about two of them. One is aging in the system, and in our incarcerated settings in Ohio, uh, age, the aging population is the fastest growing population, and since age is the biggest predictor for any kind of cognitive change, dementia is a significant problem for those in incarcerated settings. The second one that I think is of special interest here today is why on earth are people with dementia getting into the criminal justice system? We were talking this morning with someone who an 87 year old was just arrested. We need to do better. So we want to prevent unnecessary and inappropriate arrests and incarceration, and then for people who are in the incarcerated settings, ensure that they are receiving the kind of humane for person centered care that they as their own. You can read here what the ABA said, um, and I think it's very important. They're saying training is needed for everyone. You can say, what? I don't know everyone. Well, think about the court system for a minute. And think about how long someone's uh, case may take. Well, they may, their dimension may change over that three months or those six months. Are they competent before? Are they competent now? What's the difference between capacity and competence? It's very important that individuals throughout the judicial system understand product goals. So this is kind of one of the most important dumb things. If you don't listen to anything else I say, listen to the ABA. So what has our strategy been? Our strategy here in Ohio is to build on a specific program called the Dementia French Program, which is the one that uh, Justice Stratton uh, talked about. Thank you provide system-wide but flexible and adaptable training so that everybody in the system, all employees, all staff, all family members, 
understand dementia. And we do this in sector specific because what we know is if I speak your language, you're going to listen and get it. And so it's just important, it's important to me that someone in the grocery store understands as someone who is a neurologist understands. We have to speak people's language and help them understand what's important. So there are three goals here for the work that we as a state, and I showed you all of our partners, have been doing first to understand the importance of dementia in our criminal legal system. Secondly, to appreciate the impact of dementia on behavior. Our court system and our incarcerated settings demand certain kinds of behavior. They are not meant as treatment organizations. Yet if somebody forgets their commissary day, is it really their fault? Would it really hurt us to put a little sign up, today is Tuesday, it's your commissary day? We've got a lot to do. And then we want to respond and be able to ensure that we are de-escalating anything that happens in the community. Now, if I asked you what percentage of people living with dementia in Ohio are actually living in the community, it's about 80%. We have to stop thinking that it is the people in memory care units that are not able to get out of bed or incontinent, et cetera, that are, are dementia citizens. 80% are living in the community, 50% of those are living alone, and 30 to 40% of those don't have an identified care partner. Of course they're wandering. Of course they're wandering. Now what? So, the approach that we are taking in Ohio is, I believe, the same approach that all of your organizations are taking, and I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. Collective impact, talking about change versus transformation, um, and how you can wear a little hat and a big hat. And the little hat and the big hat says, each of you have a role to play in your organization. And if I tell you, this is what we need to do as a state, but it isn't going to help you in your business, or help your business thrive. You're not going to be able to do it. You have to be able to wear the big hat, which is we all care, and we're all working on this together. And you have to be successful in your position, and that's the little hat. So we'll get to that in a second. So this is what we believe and why you are all here today, is that if you don't use a collective impact model, we will get nowhere in a self-sustaining way. First, everybody has to understand the problem. That's why all of, your, all of us are here today. Second. We have to know, how do we know if we're successful? What's our measurement? Let's figure that out. But the most important thing is mutually reinforcing activities. At the end of this, each of you are going to have to think about what can I do? But I can't tell you, no, 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 that's not what you should do. You should do this, because that's not what your organization does. We all have a role, and we must be respectful of what the organizations should do. Keep communicating. Let's talk about it. And the last and most important is somebody has to step up and be the backbone of organization. Somebody has to say, yes, I will do this. I will do it. That's what I think we all share. Secondly, what we all share because we are here today is that we care more about transformation than change. Transformation change is taking the as-is state and saying, well, gosh, I can do it. A lot of ER works. I can do it cheaper. I can do it faster, one of those ER words. But we know that's not what this is all about. What it's about is all of us in this room having a vision. And on, on a Zoom. All of us having a vision and saying, what if, why not? And going from that vision and figuring out how to do the work and pull those two together, that's where we are. Secondly, if I'm going to, it's not second, I guess it's third. Or whatever. Anyway, what we're talking about today is innovation. Innovations only spread with the following things. First, you have to see a relative advantage. The crisis intervention teams have to see that when they ask somebody on the street, when they, they see somebody with dementia and the person says, I haven't seen you since college, and you say, I'm a police officer, I am not your college roommate, et cetera. That's not helpful. But if they know to say, it's been a long time since we've seen each other. How about we such and such? 
and they see that that works, and they say, I'll do it again. They've got to see that it helps them. Secondly, it's got to be consistent with your values. Is this what we do in incarcerated settings? Is this what we do with mental health, in mental health? Let's just add this. It has to be consistent. Second, it has to be really simple. You have to try it. Put your toe in the water. Like, I'm going to say, I'm a, I haven't seen you since college. It's been a long time. I'm going to try it. doesn't mean you have to change everything you do. I'm just going to try it. And then, you have to see, it really works. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We already talked about the big hat and the little hat. You guys got to, you have to bring home a paycheck. You have to care about your organization. We have to figure out a way so that you can wear, and I should have brought my hats, but I did. I have a whole bunch of them, and many of you know. You have to be able to wear your little hat and a big hat, which means you care and we're all together. To to How did this all begin to care about dementia in incarcerated settings? It began with two amazing individuals. And I don't know, raise your hand if you know Cassie um, and Kim from uh, ODRC. They are amazing, amazing women who just said, we have a problem. We have people who are aging in our system, and because of issues in, in uh, incarcerated settings, more and more of them are getting dementia. And they decided they want to make sure every single person who is working in the incarcerated settings in Ohio understands dementia. Why? When they realize it is the fastest growing segment of the incarcerated population or aging population in the world. It's really a surprise to people. Secondly, we often talk about, as you know, 65 is a cutoff for aging, but because of many of the circumstances in incarcerated settings, we use the, uh, it's about age 50. So now you can see why more and more people are in there. We figure, and this comes from the American Bar Association, that um, by 2050, the number of people living in incarcerated settings in Ohio will triple. That's huge. And then, of course, because of many of the uh, issues that go on in incarcerated settings, people have a higher risk of dementia. And so what we created for the Ohio Department of Rehab and Corrections is a program based on our Dementia Friends program, Dementia Friends for the Ohio Department of Rehab and Corrections. What they did is that they required all program staff, so this is in the thousands, in the behavioral health, in the um, physical and mental health um, and long-term care staff to go through this program. And thanks to our wonderful colleagues at the Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging, we were able to evaluate this. And one of the things that we found when we did this, of all the programs we've ever done, these are the folks that said, I care, this matters, I have learned the most, and the staff said, we want everyone to take this program. The staff said that. Our ODRC is such a wonderful organization that they actually, while on these webinars, people said to leadership, you know, what I just learned from Bonnie was that we need more fruit and vegetables. And leadership said, okay. We talked about having, uh, what if somebody doesn't remember how to make their bed? Are they really angry? Are they really trying to get back at you? No. And so they took these back and they said, let's have everyone trained. And what we have done is now on the platform, which is called Rise 360, we all 12,000 people who are employed in the Ohio Department of Rehab and Corrections have access to a self-paced, really incredible program so that they can learn about dementia. And when we did the evaluation, it was astonishing how much they learned and how much they listened because they cared so much. And as an aside, they also, all the people we've ever trained, they had more family members who were impacted by dementia, so they didn't know as well. Based on that, based on the presentation, we had the wonderful opportunity to do, we created a program um, with the Attorney General's Task Force for Jails. And I, of course, thought, like, what? I thought people just get into jail, they get out of jail. I knew nothing, uh, I'm admitting it. And I didn't realize what a big issue it was. And we are thrilled with the opportunity to be working in collaboration with the jails. If there's anyone from the um, jails here and they want to get to the program that we do from ODRC that is actually online self-paced, we'd be very happy to make sure that all of your employees and staff are able to um, get that. The 
program we use has, has about four key points, but the most important is it gets rid of the stigma, it helps people know how to interact with individuals with uh, dementia, and the most important thing for all of you is that it focuses on communication strategies. And that is key because you don't have a lot of time sometimes to make decisions. These are the symptoms that people experience with dementia that are the most trying in incarcerated settings. And in this program, we focus on all of them so that staff can understand what's going on. What we teach them on a basic level and very important for families is that dementia is not a normal part of aging. No, when somebody says, well, I'm just getting older. No, not the issue. It's caused by a disease of the brain. We talked about the different diseases. We talked about that it's more than just losing your memory, which is very important uh, when we know we're going to be talking about the community. It is possible to live well with dementia. It's not over. Life isn't over. We can do it because there is more to the person than the dementia. And that's the most important thing for all of us to understand. Now, when we go through this for our court systems, for our incarcerated settings, we talk about the 10 key symptoms, and we're not going to have time to go through those today. But what we do is we go through them and we give examples that are pertinent to the court system, are pertinent to the crisis intervention teams, um, etc. So that, so an example would be trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships. I'm going to tell you why so many people with early onset, early dementia are getting into fender benders. Their spatial sense is off. And so the police officer has stopped the person once they understand it. Now that doesn't mean it's okay to get into a fender bender. But once you use that as an example, like I never knew that. I never knew that colors made a difference. It really does. And then we go through the last one here, or we'll go through withdrawal from work and social activities. The people that don't go to their faith-based organization anymore and they say, you know, I, I never like to study the Bible. It's called the graceful cover-up because they're not able to understand it or they couldn't get on the bus or they couldn't figure something out. And so they say, I don't want to do that anymore. So we use those, somebody who is always in an incarcerated setting um, been able to go to the commissary and they're just, yeah, I don't need anything today. Maybe they just don't remember how to do it. One of the most important things, and I hope it's something you take away for your family, is some of these communication tips that we share with everyone. And the most important thing here, and I'm going to click this, give somebody 20 seconds before you expect an answer from them with, if they are living with dementia. 20 seconds is a long time, even though you don't think it is. It really, really is. Why? Should you wait that long? Well, one is if they know you're not going to wait, they're not even going to try. So they're not even using their brain. And so there are repercussions to our behavior. But the most important thing here is to avoid criticizing and correcting. If somebody is uh, thinking they are back and they're 30 years old, you say, your wife died 40 years ago, that's not helpful. Tell me more about your wife. We give them this or you really loved your wife. No, she's not coming today. Let's figure out how best to do this and avoid arguing. It doesn't help. Now, from a family standpoint, when somebody says, um, uh, well, why should I bother coming because to visit because they don't recognize me anyway? And if you are arguing with them, I will give you that free pass and say you shouldn't come. <laughs> but if you are able to have a good visit and not argue with them, they may not remember you were there, but they remember they had a good time. They remembered the beach. They didn't know they went to the beach, but they remembered they had a good time. We never, ever, no matter what we lose in a cognitive way, we never lose our emotions. We never lose love. What we teach for folks in the incarcerated settings 
in the court systems, if we are able to do that, and in the community with crisis intervention teams, are interventions. And we teach folks really simple things. Like, why can't you just redirect them? What were we doing that caused this to happen? We rewind and say, hmm, it ha probably happened because I rushed him. I shouldn't rush him. Or it probably happened because I put him next to this person and they don't get along. Figure out what was going on. Understand the most important thing, behavior is communication. If somebody can't communicate with you with their words, they're going to lash out. Behavior is communication. And then you have to stop and say, like, does it really matter that he didn't make his bed today? Does it really, really matter? And to who does it matter? Let it go. Now, I'm telling people who are running jails and other incarcerated settings, let it go, it doesn't matter. I'm not a Disney princess, I can't say that. Um, but it, it helps you understand why incarcerated settings and dementia, pretty hard to fit in. Okay. Now, think like a detective, and here's what Who was involved? Oh, he was next to John at the time that happened. What was the trigger? Was it in the morning? Was it in the afternoon? Where did it happen? It always happens on when we're try outside trying to play basketball. I wonder if there's a trigger from playing basketball. Hmm. Think like a detective. And again, rewind what happened. And has anything changed recently? You know, you're really not acting well, and yesterday was the day his wife came. Think about it. And so from there, what we did was created, and we're going to go quickly now, a Dementia Friends program for first responders. Because they are the ones that are going into the homes and seeing, like, whoa, what is going on here? And family members, unfortunately, don't always know because only 41% of people who are living with dementia actually have a diagnosis. Now stop for a second and think, if I told you about another major cause of death or a major illness and said only 40% are diagnosed, you'd say, that's not acceptable. So most families, most people do not have a diagnosis. So what we did is create a program for crisis intervention teams and for first responders. And I just want to go really quickly through this um, to show you how we do this. So the first is, like why? We always go through the why. So if we develop a program for any of you, it will always be why. And then we realize, ah, oh, most people remain in the community. Most don't have an identified caregiver. And most don't have, they live alone. Well, if you live alone and you fall, do I have to say any more? I don't think so. You've probably been there more than once. Also, we're going to see more and more visits to emergency rooms because they're not getting the care, because they're not thinking about being able to get the care when other people might be thinking about it. The key here is also that about six in 10 people living with dementia will wander. Call it that because people understand that. It's purposeful walking. But to most people, it's like, well, why are they wandering? Well, they're probably trying to get somewhere that they used to get to 20 years ago. Maybe it's to get the mail. Maybe it's to go to the store. Maybe it's to pick up, pick up the kid from the bus. I don't know. But if you are a police officer, if you are in that court system and someone just starts walking around, it's purposeful. And what we know here is that self-neglect of people living with dementia is very, very common. First, they're not willing to accept that they need help, and they just don't know to do many things. Oftentimes, Sylvia, I'm glad you're here because um, it puts people at a much higher risk of abuse. And of course, self-neglect as well. And it's the emergency responders who are the first ones to see this. So we developed a program specifically for them. Again, we go through many of all the same things. It's a 45-minute program. And then we were contacted by the amazing folks from Cleveland uh, Legal Aid Society, which is huge, by the way. Uh, 144 people, half of whom are attorneys. They said, we need help. 
We need help with people who are living with our, our, um, both our staff as family members and we are caring for people who are living with dementia. We need your help. And we created a program that now is available for all legal aid societies. And some of the key things for legal aid societies are, again, that just because somebody has dementia does not mean they can't be able to make decisions and they do not lose their legal rights. And you can see all of the things um, you must presume, begin with the presumption of capacity. And what we found is that was not necessarily the case. And so when we do this, these are the things that they knew they were not, they needed help with. We talk about what does it mean in the legal aid world to be a venture uh, capable professional. And one of the most important things here at the end is sensitive to the cultural differences. All of you in what you do are going to see cultural differences. When we started to change some of our things into working in simplified Chinese and Russian, I'm just going to pick those two languages, we were told there's no such word as caregiver in our language. Like, what? They said, it's just something you do as a family member. So you can't use caregiver even with the translations. I said, well, what do you say? It was about six sentences. Well, it's the person who provides the, and so we, uh, really need to be culturally um, sensitive. So, given the fact that we have worked in the incarcerated settings, including the jails, with crisis intervention teams, first responders, legal aid, the question is what's next? We definitely want to have new partnerships, so anybody who wants to be involved in this process, we're, we're, we're there. Um, I do not know. To me, the word no is not a complete sentence. Uh, but the word yes is, so just know if all name is done. Um, we want to make sure that all the jails, all of the incarcerated settings, all of the CIT programs, all the first responders have access to this or other information. And of course, thanks to House Bill 23, uh, we're well on our way. Um, we are, through Benjamin Rose and Scripps Gerontology Center, doing um, evaluation research and uh, dissemination. We are the first state in the country to be doing this, so it's very, very exciting. And then some exciting new initiatives. Um, this one I'm so proud of, but it doesn't exactly exist. It's just uh, we're, we're working on it. Do you know that our wonderful Ohio Department of Rehab and Corrections is interested in the problem, is interested in us developing a program specifically for people living in incarcerated settings so that they can understand what's happening to the people that they live with or their family members, or even themselves. We, we started working on this, and I cannot guarantee it's, it's going to happen. I'm um, going be and all sorts of things, but think about it. And there's a platform that we're going to be using where they're teaching already welding, other things. Well, what if we actually are training people in dementia, giving them enough information so that when they are released, and we want them to be released, they're able to go out into the community and have a job. They understand dementia. So this is really multifaceted. This is just kind of the, um, those of you who know me know I have lots of magic wands. This was one of our magic wand moments and it's coming to uh, fruition. So anything that you are thinking about in the community related to dementia, ensuring that people do not get into the criminal justice system inappropriately in the first place, or as they age in the criminal justice system, please know. The answer is yes. So I give you all of our information and I want to thank you um, for everything that I know you're going to be doing to make this world more attention. So thank you. Thank you, uh, good morning. Thank you for the presentation. I just had a follow up question. Uh, do you have any data on? Uh, the estimate of how many people we think who are currently incarcerated now that have dementia who are currently in prison? Yes, we, uh, I do not have those figures, but I can give them, um, get them for you. Now, the issue is, it's, it's a complicated question, because if only 41% of folks living in the community in general are diagnosed, the question becomes, 
are you wanting to know those who have a diagnosis or those who are living with dementia? And it's a very, very slippery, uh, slippery slope. So whatever number I give you, it's going to be more. Um, and then the other part of it is there are different stages of dementia. So we have early dementia, and then we have, as we progress in our stages, and so we have to think about that as well. We are very blessed in our state that we actually have a dementia unit. Uh, I don't know if anyone is here in the Lima area. So you want to talk about the dementia unit in the prison there? Or? I'm not real familiar with it. Oh. Um, so you may know more than that. Oh, OK. Unfortunately, we, uh, we need to step up in this area. So I'm glad I'm here today to be empowered and pick up your passion for this work. Right. Yes, and so the question question becomes, and, and to, as, a, as my follow-up question to your follow-up, to your question, should people who are living with dementia be in incarcerated settings? I, I, again, I can read your mind. Um, and it's a very complicated answer. If, and I'm going to tell you how complicated it is, when somebody is in the incarcerated setting, state is paying for it. If somebody was, don't quote me on this because I may have some of my facts wrong, not exactly right, you know. um, if someone is paroled and they go into a long-term care organization, community, the federal government is now paying two-thirds, ish. Kind of a compelling argument from a state perspective. Now, I'll argue the other side of it, though. Is that where you're going to let your mother go to that organization that has uh, people who are living in incarcerated settings and that one over there? Number one. Number two, I don't know if the care they were getting in the incarcerated setting was that great. And so what if they come out and they get lots better? Then there's the social justice side of it. People are saying they did it. Uh, on the other hand, you say, if there is somebody who is in an incarcerated setting and they don't even know they committed the crime, my heart breaks. Heart breaks. And we have in our state, specifically in the northeast part of our state, we have health care providers that would love to do more in our community for people who are the least from incarcerated settings. We have uh, in the reentry coalitions, uh, we have wonderful, wonderful opportunities. But I do not want to make it seem like it is a simple answer. Um, it is state was going to think about it, that would be where I would suggest kind of uh, some, some, start, some starting points. But that's not something that's out of the wheelhouse. I think that re-entry is, um, is something that should be on, the question of re-entry is something that should be on people's agenda. How it should be resolved, I do not know. But you also know that you have people who are living in incarcerated settings with family members who have dementia. And they potentially could care for them. I'm not taking sides. I'm just saying it's a complicated issue. I would love if as a result of this, we start thinking about it in a, a way that maybe makes sense from a, a pilot standpoint. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And thank you so much.